Hi there everyone. Once again, we're at the US Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, in the archives with the boss here, Ed Stewart, who looks after all this stuff. Now, last time we were here, I didn't tell you who was operating the camera because it's not James. James, who normally does it, he's back in the UK. It's a very special celebrity camera operator, actually. It's Tom Scott, the famous YouTuber. And guess what? We're gonna swap and he's gonna come and try and do my job and I'm gonna do the camera. What do you reckon, Tom? You up for that? I reckon you're completely misusing the word celebrity. Yeah, let's swap <laughs> over. <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> All right. I mean, Brady is very much the Apollo enthusiast. I'm very much the space shuttle enthusiast. So I have never seen a model like this. Why do they build a transparent one? The objective behind a transparent model like this is so that you can see, of course, all the internal elements. Usually something like this would be used within NASA to showcase and discuss where a particular project is on a particular section. That particular exhaust line coming up here. Right. It's intuitively obvious in a way that just isn't in cutaways. I think so. And it gets especially easier to tell that sort of thing when you look into like the main propulsion compartment back here and you've got three sets of propellant lines, you know, one for your oxidizer, one for your fuel, you know, two of those going to each engine. Yeah. So things can really become a bit of a tube farm, for lack of a better way to put it. Yeah, because that's, that's, when you actually get in close on that, everything is rooted round yes, other bits. Absolutely. So it really gives you a way to sort of orient yourself anywhere around a tank or a plumbing line or anything like that to understand how it fits into the structure. I was going to say, I don't remember the payload bay doors being split. Right. In this model, you can see that the payload bay doors are actually two sections, not counting the radiators. So on the flight vehicle, the payload bay doors were lined with a pair of radiators that were split. And that's the internal bit of plastic. Right, here. that's this piece right here. And you can see like this and this are independent and that's how they were in the flight vehicle. But the outer door, the actual payload bay doors itself, this was one large door on the flight vehicle. And in this model, it's actually two different sections. I think it's also a really good way to work out just how much space there is in that tank. Yes. That's huge in comparison. Yes, it is a massive tank. It is yeah. absolutely massive. You know, it's nice in this one because you can see the division between the oxygen tank and the hydrogen tank. Yeah. And some of the different elements that they were, you know, thinking about adding or may have taken out, that sort of thing. Five. Three, two, one, zero, and lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis. So this was before. Right. We have some other space shuttle objects here. Yes. And I, I, I'll be honest, we have no connection between them other than the space shuttle, and these looked interesting. <laughs> like, we didn't lay this out in a narrative or anything like that, but we have over here. Let's talk about the big thing here. So this is a bolt catcher that was designed wow. to hold the pieces of the explosive bolts that hold the solid rocket boosters to the shuttle's external tank. Well, you've got the external tank here. Right. And then you've got the two solid rocket boosters. So it goes up, exactly. and then those get boom, ejected out right. explosively. Right. And so there's these massive bolts that are quite literally about the size of my arm that have an explosive charge. And when that explodes, little bits f come flying yeah. apart so that the boosters can separate. Which is not ideal for space travel. Exactly. These would have been mounted where the boosters interface with the tanks so that when the two halves of the bolts separate, they would catch the bits right. in order for it to not hit the relatively fragile external yeah. tank. And after the Columbia accident in 2003, where a piece of the bolt was initially considered as potential damage on the wing of the, the vehicle, uh, they upgraded these and they added a honeycomb on the inside. So there were a lot of upgrades for return to flight, weren't there? Absolutely, a number of different things. This article is one that they would have used in ground testing to prove the design. So that would yep. have been flat, this section around here. Mm -hmm. That honeycomb at the top would have just been a flat all the way across there. And a bolt has been explosively, boom, that's how it catches it. That's amazing. Yeah. And then we have this, which I don't want to touch, partly because it's, it's a space shuttle tile. Like yes. this, is, this is a thermal tile, but also because of something you said earlier about not touching the back of it. Yes, yeah, so this particular sample is actually still enclosed in plastic, so it is safer to handle. We should say what this is. This is one of the thermal tiles that would have been destined yes. for the underside of the space shuttle mm -hmm. for re-entry. Right, so this is one of the black tiles, which would be called high temperature reusable surface insulation. This is actually a later generation one, and you can tell by the fact that when you look at the back, it's not just the pure white silica. It's been impregnated with, there was like an aluminum powder and some other elements that they started sort of mixing in with the silica. You gotta hold it, Tom. I absolutely want to hold it. Yeah, I just, absolutely. This is, oh, 
Yeah. That is about a tenth of the weight I thought it was going to be. And of course it's light, yep. because it's got to be, because it's a thermal tile, but... So the thermal so... tiles, they're between 95 and 98% air. Yeah, it's not quite aerogel, space. but it's close. It's close. And then the stuff on the back, which is why I was slightly nervous about holding this, is the silica is not something you want to get in your lungs? No, it's not something you want to get in your lungs or in your eyes or, or into your skin. And the way that this material is made, they use extremely fine, fine, fine uh, sort of almost like strands or fibers of silica. That sounds a lot like asbestos. It sounds like it, but it's not. Okay. It's not exactly the same. And this side, in addition to the coating, you've got the lettering on there. And that lettering tells you exactly where on the orbiter this tile is intended to go. Okay. And allows the technicians to track it after each flight so that they could inspect each one, check it off the list, give it a yay, it's good, nay, it's not, whether it needs to be replaced or anything like that. So it's uh, important tracking information. So that's the three things from the archives, and normally that's what Objectivity does. But my favorite space shuttle artifact in the whole Space and Rocket Center here mm. is actually on display. And I think a lot of people walk past it without realizing what it is. So there's one last thing I want to show the internet. Let's do it. I love this because it's literally just an entire wall of what is yes. the kids' play area. Um, it's, well, play area is the wrong word, but learning areas. Yeah, of, I'd say like a STEM a lot, interactive space. Yeah, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of the noise you can hear is, is kids around here moving objects, things like that. Yeah. But that is a landing simulator painting. Absolutely. So the piece that's behind us is a hand-painted large section of the approach and landing facility at Kennedy Space Center. What you see represented up there is not only the launch pads that you can see up here, but there's also a gray stripe, and that stripe is the shuttle landing facility. It's even got like wheel marks yes. from the multiple landings that would have happened by Absolutely. Yeah. And this is early, so this is 1970s era. And so your training simulation at this stage of the game is analog. So there would have been a camera and a set of lights to mimic the sun that would travel on tracks across this map that could not only just go, you know, the one direction, but it could move height and it could translate side to side as well. So you could get basically full control as you sort of fly in and approach the runway. And not only did they use this one for training the astronauts how to do the approach and landing, but they also utilized it to help refine the guidance and navigation system in the orbiters themselves. So the information that the uh, pilot was getting and the, the data feedback that was coming into the systems from the joystick inputs and those sorts of things. So I wasn't just training the astronaut, it was also training the computer. And it's just sat here in the corner and everyone's yes. going to walk past it because they think it's just, just wall art. And yes. it's not. This was actual yeah. space shuttle landing tech. Yeah. I love that. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. My pleasure. This, For is, sure. this has been wonderful. Thank you, Brady, behind the camera. Thank you, Tom. I got in the archives here. Thank you so yeah. much. Absolutely. Good to have you. And so whose yeah. glove is this? So this is uh, Ken Mattingly's glove. And uh, each glove was actually custom fit to the astronaut's hands. So inside the glove, there's a tag that has his name on there. And a lot of these elements will say, instead of a size like small, medium, large, will say size Mattingly or size Cernan, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, Ken Mattingly, he was the chap that was going to fly on the ill-fated right. Apollo 13, but got sick and didn't go. Yes. And then he did fly on Apollo 16. Absolutely.